Thank you very much, Ija, for the introduction. Uh, so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and uh, I will be presenting some research we have done and we have been doing in the Center for Machine Learning Research in the University of O. So, in the beginning, I'd like to briefly introduce the group I have been working in. It's the Center for Machine Learning Research. So it's, uh, it was established in 1981. So we have celebrated its 30 years anniversary in 2011. And uh, now uh, there are four professors in this group. And as well, uh, we have a video pro professor, uh, Professor Xinin Chen from Chinese Academy of Sciences. And we have as well uh, five adjunct professors about uh, 12 postdoctoral researchers and 18 doctoral students. And our personnel are pretty international. They are from, um, majorly from Finland, and uh, uh, some from China, Algeria, Italy, Spain, and uh, <coughs> some other countries. So currently, about 50% or a little bit over half of the researchers in our group are from abroad. So it's uh, pretty international. <coughs> and uh, the in external funding we got uh, for the year 2013, because now I, I, I haven't seen the statistics for last year, so now I give the number for the year before, uh, last year. So uh, the total external funding we got, just our group, is about 1.95 million euros. And uh, the external funding are mainly uh, from Academy of Finland, uh, Ministry of Education and Culture, uh, DEGES and the EU, as well as some industry. Uh, in last year, in total, we had uh, um, 67 uh, scientific uh, publications. And uh, since 2005, we have uh, got 15 papers uh, published uh, in the uh, top PEMI journal. Uh, our papers are frequently cited, uh, for example, um, that LBP, local binary pattern um, papers, accepted, uh, published in PEMI in 2002, and now it's the um, first uh, uh, paper, I mean, um, considering the publications in Finland, it's the top one after it's published. Uh, in the year before last year, our university had a um, research evaluation assessment. So um, the research groups were evaluated uh, by an international uh, <coughs> evaluation committee, and our group got the highest grade um, inside the whole university. We have uh, the international collaborations with the top research groups. For example, uh, there in USA, we have collaborated with University of Maryland uh, and University of California. And in China, uh, we have collaborated with Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, and also with Japan and UK, France, some other countries. Uh, and since our group was established in 1981, and uh, there were a couple of research groups, as shown there, have been spinned off from our group. And as well, there are many companies has been spinned off from our groups, and uh, the other groups spinned off from our uh, original group. Uh, here are some research topics uh, we have been doing um, in the whole group. For example, local binary patterns, some low-level uh, feature representations, and uh, some new textual descriptors, computational imaging, geometrical computer vision, object uh, detection recognition, face recognition, biometrics. So I wouldn't uh, see all of them. So. It's about <laughs> everything in the computer vision field. Uh, 
So here are many um, the research we carried out in my own group. So today I will talk about uh, the motion analysis with special temporal descriptors. Mm, so uh, there are, for example, dynamic texture analysis, expression and micro expression by signal reconstruction, visual speech analysis. So it's pretty diverse. Uh, I think I may be briefly introduce uh, most of them, and uh, for some of them, like microexpression uh, by signal reconstruction, since it's um, relatively new research and uh, relatively unique, so I may give more details. So let's start from the dynamic texture descriptors. Uh, actually, textures are everywhere, and uh, it's uh, considered as fundamental property in images. Uh, dynamic textures are textures in motion. They offer a uh, new approach to the motion analysis. Why we um, started with dynamic textures as a basic research and later uh, extended them to other computer vision applications? Because for many um, computer vision problems, for example, the face or facial expression analysis, if you um, take a local area, like a mouse corner, forehead, actually, they are textures. And uh, with the motion, so we can use a dynamic texture representation to analyze such kind of problems locally. Uh, for the local binary pattern, uh, I want to ask that uh, uh, has anybody uh, know it or have used it? Could you raise your hand? Okay, not many. Maybe I still need to briefly introduce it. Uh, so um, this local binary pattern, um, it's a kind of low-level feature representation for textures. And uh, it has been uh, proposed in 1996. And uh, uh, recent 10 years, it got lots of attention and has been effectively used to, for example, face recognition. And uh, the method actually is pretty simple for understanding and for implementation. And it's amazing, it's really like effective. Uh, so this is the basic LBP calculation. For example, if we take a local region and we take a central pixel, and then we can have, we can define a neighbor area. For example, here it's a rectangular area. And we can compare, for example, here the intensity of the neighbor point against the central pixel. And we can get the threshold data binary string. For example, if it's um, bigger than the central one, it's one. If it's lower, or e and it's zero. So we can get uh, this kind of binary string. We call it uh, a presentation of a pattern. And here, we can assign a weight to each bit. In this way, we transform this binary string into a decimal number. And it's just used as an index for this pattern. Mason is the representation of this pattern. This is used as an index. It's some important property of LBP is that it's invariant to the monotonic grid level changes. For example, if uh, they are the intensity is shifted or skewed, it wouldn't change that pattern representation. And as well, the computation is really simple and fast. Even without uh, GPU, it can be implemented real time. Here is the uh, uniform patterns. So we have this kind of binary um, pattern. It's a, a string of zero and one. Uh, if the transition from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 is maximally 2, 0 or 2, we call they are uniform patterns. Or we can see if they could be clustered into two, maximally two clusters, so they are uniform. 
and if the transition are more than two, and they are non-uniform. And in the statistics of the image representations, the uniform patterns are the majority. So it means they are more discriminative or more representative. So we can see this kind of pattern. It can represent the micro textures. For example here, all white, it's, it could be a spot. And this all ones could be a spot or flat area. And uh, this can be a lot and an edge or a corner. I think that's why it's so effective for local area. Uh, but uh, my own group, we are more interested in the motion stuff, not just a static image, but a video, because we believe then we can have more useful information than just from one image. So how we can extend the LBP, this is used for static texture, right? To capture not just the static information, but also temporal information. So that's the work here. And we proposed the volume local boundary pattern and later another variant LPP top features to capture special temporal information. Uh, for example, there we can have many frames. They are from a video sequence. And then if we consider one a central pixel from one frame, at the same time, so we can consider its neighbor points, not just from its own frame, but also from the previous and the posterior frames, right? And then in that way, we get a kind of local binary pattern description. It embeds not just the information from its own current frame, but also from its previous and posterior frames. But a problem is that we put uh, on the neighboring point uh, from a couple of frames together. So it makes the length of the feature vector increase drastically. And it limits the use of the neighbor information. That's really a problem. So later we propose the, the LPP from a three also gonna place. So here they are the stack of the frames and uh, consider one central pixel there, and uh, we can get a three orthogonal place, and uh, there are stacks of x, y images, and uh, we extract uh, for one pixel, not just uh, from x, y, but also from x, t, and uh, y, t place. And uh, we extract the features separately from three orthogonal place. In that way, we get the representation from the spatial temporal domain. As well, for each play, we can make uh, the LBP uh, extraction more flexible. Uh, it uh, could be rectangular, it could be circular, or even we can change the number of the neighbor point and the radius along different axes, make it ellipse. In this way, we can consider different resolution in the spatial domain and the temporal domain. So here, that is the video sequence of a dynamic texture. And uh, this is a XY play. It's just uh, the appearance of the dynamic texture. And this is from XT play. It shows the horizontal motion of this video sequence. And this is from a YT domain. And we can see how it moves in the vertical motion. And uh, simply, we can concatenate uh, the RBP histograms from each play and uh, put them together. This method uh, has been used uh, to uh, many applications like a facial expression, action recognition, uh, and lip reading. For example, here we have one a paper published in motion vision and the application and uh, for action recognition. And as well, we also uh, worked on other new descriptors. For example, here, this WLD descriptor. Mm, it's from uh, the fact that uh, 
people's perception of a pattern depends not only the changes of the signal, but also the original intensity of the signal. For example, in a very quiet environment, people just whisper, it can work well. But if in a very noisy environment, people need to speak loudly. So that's based on this Weber's law. So the, the features were extracted uh, from the differential excitation and also the orientation. And it can be used for the static and the spatial temporal analysis. And also, uh, we worked out uh, the LBP difference features. Because uh, like LBP, it's a binary pattern. It's binary string, right? One, zero, zero, one, something like that. Even though we converted it to decimal value, but it's just an index. So that means it's not in the Euclidean space. It's hard to combine it with some other popular features extracted from the Euclidean space. So here in this work, we um, put the original LBP just as the binary, binary vector. And then we firstly calculate a mean vector still for each bit, not for full full decimal value, but for each bit of the LBP. And then we calculate the magnitude and the sign of one pixel's binary pattern against the mean value. Then we get LBP D features. Now it's really in a Euclidean space. It can be combined with any other, like a IGB or the derivative or some other method. We put them all together to the covariance matrix and it works really nice. And uh, we also worked on some feature selection and uh, uh, this one is based on the facial discriminative. Uh, it's pretty simple but uh, it's, uh, it works uh, very, very good. Uh, so for each image we can learn the dominant patterns which patterns are, are more important for one image. And then for the images, they belonging to the same class, we get a kind of intersection of the dominant patterns. So we believe the inter intersection, they are the common features for all the images in the same class. And then for the samples from different classes, we put them in a, uni, in a uniform. And in this way, we selected uh, the more effective and the discriminative features. So uh, for dynamic texture analysis, we also have, ha have worked uh, on the segmentation. This is the input. And uh, we wanted to get the output like that is to segment a sequence of the images from a natural scene, for example, into disjoint regions uh, which have the constant spatial temporal statistics. There are uh, many potential applications. And uh, here is uh, the framework. For each input uh, video, we firstly compute uh, the features and here we use uh, local binary pattern from through also gonna place and the uh, WLD top. Uh, these two are, uh, they both are from the spatial temporal domain, not just from one image, it consider its neighborhood. Um, and as well, we use the histogram of the oriented optical flow. Uh, and then here is the segmentation part. Mm. And it include, includes three steps, uh, a splitting, mer merging, and the classification. Uh, so the measurement of the similarity is important. Uh, based on it, uh, we do the uh, splitting and the merging. Uh, and here we use the histogram intersection to calculate uh, the uh, similarities because all the features we extracted are kind of histograms. Uh, so 
after that, uh, the first step is uh, splitting. So we will recursively split each input frame into this kind of uh, square blocks with the varying size. And uh, after that, uh, we merge those similar adjacent regions. If they are similar enough, we consider then they should uh, uh, be the same dynamic texture. Then we merge that. So we can get a rough boundary, but they are not uh, so accurate. So for the boundaries, then we do the uh, pixel-wise classification again. That means for each pixel in the boundary, we use their features, and then we compare the similarity of it with its neighbor area. Then we see if uh, we give a different label to its current label. If it's di different, then we relabel it. Let's get to the final segmentation. Here are some uh, segmentation results and some comparisons. And uh, so here is a, a more challenging sequence. So uh, it's not so clear, and there are noisy, there are many things there. And uh, so we can see uh, our segmentation. It can get the people um, quite accurately from this complicated environment. And uh, also, um, we have done dynamic texture synthesis. Uh, what's it? It's uh, mm, if we have a limited length of uh, video sequence, and we'd like to get a longer or infinite length of a video sequence. So that's dynamic texture synthesis. Uh, in our work, there are two major stages, video staging and the transition smoothing. Uh, the basic researchers for uh, basic approaches for this problem are parametric uh, approaches. For these ones, they need to create the new images. So it makes the synthesized video sequence looks not natural because they are really created so you can see clearly artificial stuff. And uh, another category is non-parametric approaches. So it's try to pick from the original image sequences and then put them together in a natural way, let it go infinitely. So our method belong to the second category. For the input dynamic textures, and we need to firstly calculate the features for each frame, and then we calculate the similarity for each pair of the image sequences. And uh, there we use n frame LBP top as features, and we calculate uh, their similarity for each pair from this uh, video sequence, and we use chi square as the distance measure. Uh, and then we choose the transition from this similarity measure. But it could be not so natural. It can, can be some jump from this selected transition. Then we do the transition smoothing. We build the group's model, and we do a kind of registration for the synthesized part, for the arti artificial transition, and then make the motion smooth. So I show <coughs> some video sequences. Let me see. Uh, sorry, here I guess the link doesn't work here. Okay, and uh, then you can go to um, that link uh, and uh, to see more video sequences. And uh, uh, in this way, especially like in games or in the web page designment. Uh, uh, for which they need a uh, longer uh, video sequences, and this is a very good way to synthesize it. And uh, we not only synthesize it in the uh, temporal domain, and later we also put uh, the spatial domain synthesis, synthesis together to make it not, not longer, but also bigger. 
And our uh, another work uh, we have done quite a lot in my group is expression and micro expression. Uh, I would not give much detail about uh, the general expression analysis, uh, and many groups have been doing that. Um, so this way we um, analyze the dynamic changes using the longitudinal uh, information. And uh, for this one, uh, we uh, we extracted the component based features, and uh, we do the uh, sparse representation to check which part is occluded to deal with the facial occlusion. And uh, in this work, uh, we use uh, mm, the multi-view uh, canonical correlation analysis to deal with uh, the view changes. And we also worked on the near infrared uh, to handle the illumination changes because illumination is a big uh, problem. Uh, for visible lights. And the near infrared can reduce the complicated illumination into just the monotonic changes. And our LBP features is invariant to these monotonic changes. So we put them together, they bring a illumination change robust system. We also have done the um, action unit detection in the 3D space. Okay, we move to micro-expression, and uh, this is quite unique uh, in our research area. So uh, micro-expression is a very rapid, involuntary muscle movement in the face area. It cannot be posed. It's not like the general expression people use to obviously to convey the messages, they are obvious. But for micro-expression, it happens when people try to suppress their internal strong emotions, but, uh, but the feeling makes uh, the, the facial movement uh, uh, leak the information, the real emotions. So firstly, it cannot be posed. It must be spontaneous. And as well, it cannot be analyzed just from one static image because it's so small, it's so short, so quick. Just from image, one image, you couldn't see anything. Only when you have a video sequence and you check it very carefully, you may get it. So for example, here. Yeah, you see a very, very quick moment. And uh, actually this one, maybe it's the most uh, obvious one from our micro expressions. Let's see the differences between the, I call their macro expression uh, for the general expressions and the micro expression. Uh, for micro expression, the main characteristic is its duration. It's a very short, even though there are uh, arguments, uh, but uh, most uh, psychologists agree it should be less than half a second. And uh, uh, as well, the muscle movement is very subtle, very, very subtle. If you use facts to code it, it's intensity even lower than the lowest intensity which can be coded. And as well, it's from the repressed or suppressed emotions not like a macro expression, they are from the expressed. They used the intentionally to co convey the message. So if you see there, above one is macro expression, the uh, lower one is micro. So for, for the top one, you still can get the information just from that one image. But uh, for the lower one, can you see anything if I give you just the one image? It's, it's really, really hard. It needs a video sequence to analyze its movement. And if you see that curve, the red one is for that macro, so it's uh, longer, it lasts a longer time. And the micro is just uh, so short, it's just a flash. There are lots of potential applications, uh, interrogation, and uh, in the business negotiation, and uh, mental problem assessment. Uh, 
And uh, we had uh, the first work uh, published in RCCV 2011, and at th that time uh, we believed uh, this is the first work on the spontaneous microexpression. <coughs> And when we started uh, this research, uh, there was no any available spontaneous databases. Even though psychologists have done some research, but uh, there they were no any um, databases for our use for computer vision researchers. So we collected our own datasets. Mm, we picked up some emotional movie clips. They were suggested by psychologists to use to induce the microexpressions. And uh, we also use the high-speed camera. As I said, it's so quick, so short. So if you use ordinary camera, for example, uh, if it's last uh, one third uh, second, uh, and uh, you may just have seven, eight frames of the micro expression. So we use the high-speed camera. So we ask the pe people to watch the emotional movie clips. We ask them must to keep a poker face. And the instructors will uh, like watch them, try to guess what category of movie clips they were watching. If the guess was correct, then they will be punished by, by, something, <laughs> by some tasks. So in this way, we induced micro expressions. I show, for example, here, <laughs> the movie we use to induce fear emotion. And here is the video we collected, and, uh, and it has been slowed down 10 times. You can see some movement in the forehead and the eye area. And, uh, but it, it has been slowed down. If, we, if I play it in normal speed, probably we can see, we can see very little information. This movie used to induce happy emotion. And uh, this one is the video sequence we collected you may see some subtle movement in the in the mouse in the mouse corner here over there so here is our database the snake database mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it's the first uh, spontaneous micro expression database. And uh, so we use a high speed camera and uh, then two ordinary camera, visible light and near infrared, uh, to capture our data. And uh, there are 20 participants, but uh, finally we just uh, uh, saw the micro expressions from 16 subjects. So, four people really like uh, very, very good to suppress the emotions. We didn't. Uh, see anything from their faces. And uh, we um, labeled them into positive, negative, and the surprise. Uh, here is our, uh, the framework in that paper. Mm. So uh, we firstly do some alignment, uh, and then we extract LBP top features, uh, and then we normalize the video sequences, make it more flexible to put more uh, parameters and uh, feature selection, and we use multiple, uh, multiple kernel learning for the uh, recognition. And uh, here are some uh, experimental results, and there are uh, two tasks, detection and recognition, but here detection is not a real detection. It's a kind of 
two class classification to classify if this is a micro-expression or non-micro-expression. And then another task is recognition, to recognize it's a positive or negative or surprise. We put a surprise outside uh, positive and negative because it's, uh, it's not, uh, not either of them. And uh, so it seems that uh, performance from high speed is a bit better than the ordinary camera. So it, uh, it does give us more information. Um, but uh, we, the classification was done on the already segmented uh, video sequences. But actually, firstly, we need to know if there is micro-expression and where is it first. And then we can do the further analysis, right? So we need to firstly to do the spotting or detection of microexpression. It's to find the temporal location of the face-related events, microexpression here from a very long video sequences. And uh, so I go to the algorithm. Uh, we used uh, three stable points as shown here. They were manually given because we tried many landmark detections. It, all of them wouldn't work on it because they are, firstly, they are not so accurate. Secondly, we have micro expression movement. Even there's no, nothing happened, the landmarks can be floating somewhere. So it really can mess up everything. So we use these three. We think they are more stable than the other landmarks. And we use KLT to check these this points. And uh, then the face images were divided into some blocks. Here we tried the different features, but uh, surprisingly, MVP, um, so far in our experiments, it works better than others like optical flow. And uh, main thing, we need to calculate the difference because uh, uh, the main characteristics is its duration, its speed. It's very fast, it's very short duration. That's the main difference for the micro expression from other expressions. So we have sliding window for each frame. We uh, consider it as a central frame. And then we predefined or specified uh, a duration. And it's like a less than half second, something like that. Then we get the head frame and the tail frame for this central frame. Uh, that is a mic micro interval. And uh, then we calculate, uh, firstly, the average of the top and tail, uh, tail and the head frames. Then we need to calculate the difference. That was considered as the changes in the appearance of, uh, of the face area to see if there is uh, some quick movement happens there. And then we get a curve like this. And uh, we use threshold uh, and peak detection to detect uh, those very quick uh, facial muscle movement. So here are some example results. This stuff uh, was spotted from this long video sequence. We can see the real micro expression was spotted. Uh, and uh, at the same time, many eye blinks were also spotted. I will later talk about that, that problem. Here we see databases, and we uh, experimented on three so far the public data, data sets. And here are the uh, ROC curves. And uh, we can see that uh, for the uh, Smaker, our data set, we got about uh, 0.9, and uh, for the other two, 0.9, 0.82. So they are pretty good. Uh, and if you see some numbers uh, there, we have the true positive rate uh, from 52 uh, to 71 um, from different uh, data sets separately. Uh, 
we not only can detect where it happened in the spatial domain, we also can detect in which facial region it appears because we calculate the features and the differences for each small region. So here we can pick, for example, the one third, which we, we with the largest block appearance changes, as shown here. And uh, so we see the, the bigger changes happens in here, right? The, the white part the in the brow racer and here, the lip corner depressor and uh, brow lower. So like for this one, and uh, the ground truth is action uh, 1, 4, and 15. So eye blinks was a problem. Many of them were spotted. So uh, there were arguments, because eye blinks, it also consistent to the micro expression definition. It's also very short, very quick, and it's spontaneous. Uh, and uh, but. Uh, in our data set, we noticed that many of them are really related to the real micro expressions. Uh, some of them are emotionless. So that, that's a problem we need to solve in the future. And our method is quite uh, simple and uh, it works fast and it doesn't need any pre-training and pre-labeling information. And uh, I show you one uh, video sequence. Try to see if there is micro expression. Did you see anything? And uh, so here is uh, our work. There is a difference for each frame. And uh, yeah, there are eye blinks uh, spotted and the one micro expression spotted uh, as well. Let's see again, I blink here, micro expression close to I part. Yeah. Uh, so uh, nextly, uh, I may Briefly introduce, I try to briefly <laughs> introduce this, this uh, work. This is a new work we published uh, last year. And it's, it's to measure the heartbeat from the video sequences. How can we measure the heartbeat? heartbeat? So we know that we can have some device put to the chest, uh, put to the uh, wrist, and uh, we can <coughs> measured heartbeat. And also it can be done from other body parts, like from a figure. And it's quite uh, um, common to, to do in hospital. And, uh, <coughs> and also from ears. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, we can do that in a very traditional way. Um, it only can be done in hospital to uh, get the ECG, the curve. Mm, and uh, uh, recently, it could be more convenient uh, with some smartphone, smart, uh, smart uh, device, and it, it, it also can measure it uh, with some close contact. But uh, still, they all need to be contact, close contact. But for many environment, for example, they are in the business negotiation or here when you have a Skype chat with your friend and uh, could you put any device close to, to the people? No, it's no way. So the key thing here is firstly it's remote and secondly, the only thing we can use is the camera. The images and the videos are only the input for it. So can we get the bus signal from videos? It would be very useful for us. We can use uh, such kind of signal for many things, for emotion, for example, and uh, for health, for some other things. And later we can see some examples. Actually, the answer is yes. Currently, there are some um, works done for it. Uh, one is color-based method, another is motion-based method. For example, this one, color-based method. So the motivation is that uh, the 
blood volume of microvascular changes together with the cardiac pulse. And as we see, uh, when image capture there and the ambient uh, light, uh, some absorbed uh, and some f reflected, uh, captured by camera. And those signals are so tiny, and our eyes cannot see them. And also because it's so tiny, it can be overwhelmed easily by any other noises, illumination or your movement, uh, and anything, it can overwhelm it. It's so subtle. If we just uh, pick one pixel in the forehead, you can get uh, the appearance changes like that. It, it's just random. It's nothing useful for us. But if we take an uh, area, and then the signal are more regular, it uh, seems more relevant to the heartbeat. And uh, for example here, it's an original captured video sequence. And, uh, from our eyes, we can see nothing. And uh, from this one, it was uh, processed by this magnification method. And we can see the appearance changes caused by the pulse. It, it's, it's really amazing. So uh, when color-based method was done like that, they take a facial area and the RGB channel, and then they do ICE, and they uh, get uh, the signal relevant to heartbeat. And also motion-based method. And the motivation is that uh, the, um, uh, it shows that uh, there is subtle head uh, oscillation. Uh, they are caused by the um, cardiovascular circulation. This is our original video sequence, and uh, nothing. This is uh, magnified by the magnification method, and uh, you can see something related to the pulse. But uh, even though some methods have been proposed, published, are they really working well? Firstly, there are big limitations of those methods. Firstly, the subject needs to be strictly static. You can't do anything, just stand or sit strictly static. And uh, then the environment should be well controlled. No illumination changes, no dynamic background, nothing. Nothing, just clear, everything clear. And the original signal should be high quality. But uh, in the human-computer interaction scenarios, it's not possible. And uh, there could be rigid head movement. Uh, when people talk or do anything, it, they, they, they certainly they can move their head. They, it's hard for them to keep uh, strictly static, right? And as well, there could be non-rigid uh, uh, movement, uh, like people smiling, people making expressions, and also people talking. They all are non rigid uh, movement. And also, there is environment global changes, the illumination, the background. Those methods wouldn't work. So, here are our solutions. Our solutions are also based on the colors, no motion, because motion are really sensitive. People, they, this motion uh, is really subtle, and just people move their head, it can overwhelm any motion there. And here, our color-based method, there are two steps to deal with those limitations. The first step is that we um, use this area, and it was uh, detected uh, by some, uh, using some detected landmarks, and then we track the point to uh, adapt this mask through the video sequences. And uh, that is to deal with the regent head movement. So when you move your head, we always use this area. It's uh, relatively stable. And the uh, second step is to deal with the illumination changes. Uh, we use the background as a reference. So we assume the global illumination, when they affect your face area, they also affect your background. So there, uh, that is original signal from face. And here is the signal from the background that we use as a reference. Then we use the normalized least mean square uh, filters 
to filter them to get uh, the more information, the more re <coughs> reliable information. The third step is to deal with the non-region movement uh, when people are smiling, when people are talking. Uh, because uh, remember, our target is to get the average heartbeat, not the heartbeat for each time point, but the average. So here, we, get, uh, we put them into the segments, and then we calculate uh, the standard deviation. If there is uh, some big change, and uh, then we believe they, in that part something happens. So people from doing nothing there, uh, to they, they talking, they making expressions, then we drop, uh, drop them out. We don't use them because they are not uh, reliable for our task. Then we put uh, the other information together and use them to calculate the average heartbeat. And the first step is use some temporal filterings to convert uh, the signal into the frequency domain. And uh, the power spectral distribution estimates uh, uh, the signal's power distribution. And here are some experimental results. And uh, there were no any public data sets, even though we asked the authors of those publications, but they, they didn't share. So firstly, we um, captured a easy data. We just used our iPad and in the office and the capture database, but we asked people, don't move, don't do anything, just uh, static. And nothing changed. And then we validate if uh, the implementation of other method is correct uh, and if they are working. We see there the mean error rate uh, here. All of them are working really well. And uh, then we move them to a challenging data set. That is Mahanov data set. That data set was uh, collected for emotion analysis, not for this task. But uh, good point is that uh, not only the face were collected, were captured. They also captured the heartbeat. So in that, that way, we have both signals. We have ground truth. Then we can test our method. And uh, there, in that data set, because it's for emotion analysis, so people watching movies, watching computers, they can, they can talk. They, they definitely have expressions there. And uh, they move their head. And also because they are close to the computer, so there are illumination changes. So it used for evaluate our method and for the comparison. And then we see here, when we move to this challenge, more close to the human computer interaction scenario, the other method uh, don't work. The error rate are so big. But ours works much better, much, much better than the others. So considering those challenging situations, we would say that our work uh, is much more accurate and uh, reliable. The advantage is that it's remote and we only use ordinary camera, and not uh, any special camera, but only ordinary. And the motions are allowed uh, and uh, people can do some interaction, for example. And uh, we are not aiming to replace the traditional device. It's not possible. And the, the traditional device, they can provide much more accurate, much more additional information. That's what we cannot do. But our aim is to make the cameras smarter, to make the cameras have more uh, capability. And uh, now they can measure our heartbeat without contact. And it can be used now, for example, for effective computing. It provided us additional channel, the by signals. We can combine it with facial expressions and body gestures for emotion analysis. And uh, it uh, can be used, for example, for lie detection. When people are lying, so definitely there are some by signal changes. And it um, maybe not uh, can be seen from faces. And also, it can be used for anti-spoofing. If you show a picture or a video or wear a mask, and uh, mm, basically, the measured heartbeat should be outside uh, the feasible range. It might be very low, for example, uh, around zero should be. 
then we can say this is not a real people, it's something else. And uh, here is uh, one video. Yes, we do uh, the landmark and uh, the area determination, and we check the points to adapt the mask. And uh, there is the raw signal, and the lower part is the background reference, and there is the measured heartbeat. The blue one is the ground truth, and the red one is the, our, our measured heartbeat. OK, and uh, we also have done some work on video speech analysis, but I wouldn't uh, give more details. So it's, uh, the task is to uh, recognize what people are speaking just from the movement of the mouse, no audio information. Because in some noisy environment, uh, or if um, there is glass in between, you cannot uh, hear clearly about the voice, but you can see the mouse movement. And uh, also, if the audio is available, if you put uh, the video together, the movement of the mouse, and uh, people can understand uh, better. So that's why we do the lip reading. And um, so, yes, and uh, for this one, it was published last year in Padme. So there we um, proposed uh, a generative latent variable model. Uh, and uh, this model uh, can separately represent uh, uh, the variations caused by the speakers, for example, speakers' identity their appearance, different appearance from different people. And also the variations caused by noise, <coughs> illumination changes, something like that. And also the uh, variation caused by the utterance. That's what we need to use for the lip reading. And uh, this work is uh, to synthesize the talking mouse. Um, so as show. And uh, this video is synthesized. Uh, this lady never see this uh, word, this sentence. And we use the training data to synthesize uh, a new utterance. She never talked. And uh, we put them into an audio visual face animation. So uh, for a new uh, utterance, uh, we compare it against uh, the existing ones and get the optimal combination of the phone names and then use the video uh, image sequences to, to synthesize a new utterance which is consistent to the, uh, to the audio, to the phone names. So like here, we use this lady's mouse movement. Uh, uh, they are available in our training set. And then we use this gentleman's face. And then we synthesize just the mouse area and we put it to the, to the gentleman's face and we get the synthesized, synthesized <coughs> talking face. As I show here, this is <coughs> our robot. It recognizes people, expression, and the gender. Hello. Talk with Hi. the robot. Yeah. Okay. So the face is from this uh, our researcher, and uh, the mouth was synthesized. So you can see it's not so natural. It's put together with the lady's mouth with this man's face. Okay, fine. I think um, that are um, the main research. Um, I would like to present it today. So we have done a lot for the low level facial representations. And we also do the um, application research like facial expression and the micro expression action uh, recognition of the visual speech. So it's quite uh, diverse. And uh, we um, have a book 
uh, published uh, by Springer, it's about uh, local bundle patterns and uh, its applications. Uh, and uh, our project, uh, I need to thank our sponsors, <laughs> Academy of Finland, Degas, and Infratech Oulu, University of Oulu, and here are my group members, um, three doctors and uh, uh, four PhD students and one master students. And, uh, um, they all are working in my group, and uh, thanks. Okay, fine, thank you very much.